Tonight, millions threatened by dangerous weather. The West buried under feet of snow with howling winds. Fire alerts across the central U.S. as conditions worsen in the largest wildfire in Texas history. First, the snow, 4 to 12 feet expected in the Sierra Nevada. Blizzard conditions with a major interstate shut down. Drivers stranded, some waiting hours to be rescued. Even ski resorts closing. A rare tornado near Fresno, California, terrifying students. On the Texas Panhandle, the Smokehouse Creek fire leaving two dead, more than a million acres burned, plus rain in the northeast and the big change coming. Our weather team tracking it all. Also tonight, help from above. The U.S. military airdropping tens of thousands of meals into Gaza, joining an international effort as aid groups warn of an approaching famine. Plus new reporting on a possible ceasefire and hostage release. Tom Sufi Burridge reports from Israel. Three days to Super Tuesday, 15 states holding contests. Donald Trump hoping to lock up the GOP nomination. Nikki Haley vowing to stay in the race, but can she win in any of the Super Tuesday states? Mary Alice Parks following the candidates. An arrest in a crime that shocked Pennsylvania's Amish community. A man accused of murdering a 23-year-old pregnant woman and her unborn baby. What we're learning about the suspect. A paramedic going to prison, sentenced to five years for his role in the death of Elijah McClain, the young man who died after being placed in a chokehold by police and given an excessive dose of ketamine by paramedics. On the verge of history, the feat LeBron James could reach tonight that no NBA player has ever accomplished before. And remembering Iris Apfel, the designer who worked with nine presidents and became a fashion icon in her 80s and 90s. From ABC News World Headquarters in New York, this is World News Tonight. Good evening. Thanks for joining us on this Saturday. I'm Whit Johnson. As we come on the air tonight, millions are on alert for dangerous weather. From California to Texas, every state in the West dealing with either winter or wind alerts, some under both. In the Sierra Nevada, whiteout conditions forcing the shutdown of part of I-80, stranding motorists travel in the region next to impossible. The impact expected to last for days. In the Texas Panhandle, strong winds fueling the state's largest ever wildfire, the deadly Smokehouse Creek fire now covering an area bigger than the state of Rhode Island. At least two people killed, as many as 500 structures destroyed. The fire threat stretching from the Lone Star State into Nebraska and Wyoming, and those blizzard conditions expected to drop up to 12 feet of snow in the Sierra Nevada. Our weather team standing by to time this all out, but we begin tonight with ABC's Faith Abube from Truckee, California. Tonight, that life-threatening winter storm roaring through the Sierra Nevada mountains, packing blizzard conditions and a high risk for avalanches. Nearly four feet of snow already, several more feet expected. Some communities experiencing up to 70 mile per hour wind gusts. But man, there is just no relief uh, for the Sierra. That snow continues to fall. Interstate 80 shut down for more than 70 miles. Drone video capturing stranded drivers. You can see their hazard lights flashing. The California Highway Patrol says a mass amount of vehicles were stuck over Donner Summit last night and that it took several hours for emergency personnel and tow trucks to reach them. Truckee resident Randy Davis describing the snowfall as exceptional. Now it looks to be about, uh, well, over two feet of snow. I've never seen it drop this much snow in one night here. We met Carrie Klink racing to clear snow before even more of it falls, describing the intensity of those blizzard winds. You know, last night, even the, the windows are shaking and stuff. In central California, a rare tornado touching down Friday afternoon in Madera County, ripping branches from trees and damaging a classroom at Baranda Elementary. Emily Soto and her sister Aline were in the cafeteria for an after school program. I just heard everyone screaming and like branches and trees just falling down and the tutors try to close the door and they grabbed everyone to go on the floor. Thankfully, no injuries reported. Faith Abube joining us now from Truckee, California, along that closed Interstate 80, a major thoroughfare. We can see, that Faith, the snow still coming down. Any word yet on when it will reopen? 
Well, with the state's Department of Transportation is discouraging all mountain travel. Crews are out right now evaluating conditions and trying to clear all the roadways, but they haven't said when they expect I-80 to fully reopen. Between the winds here and the snow, the storm system is affecting every single state here in the West. With Major impacts. Faith, thank you. Let's go right to ABC News meteorologist Samara Theodore. And Samara, how long will this storm last and where is it headed next? Well, Whit, this is a multi-round event lasting through Tuesday, pushing from California deeper into the Rockies. Let's go ahead and time this out. So overnight, we have another round of heavy snow falling in the Sierra. Now tomorrow, this becomes light, giving the response to a crime, uh, the response crew time to clear it out. The next round arrives late Monday into Tuesday. Grand totals by Wednesday could reach 12 feet in the Sierra and a couple of feet in the Rockies. As for the devastating fire in Texas, conditions remain primed for spreading through Monday from the Texas Panhandle to Grand Rapids, where they could see relative humidity as low as 6%, winds reaching 45 miles per hour as far as the gust goes. Meanwhile, here in the Northeast, soggy conditions continue overnight, with a second round anticipated on Tuesday and temperatures hitting record highs in the 70s in the coming days. Whit? Well, brace for those changes. Samara, thank you. Overseas now, U.S. officials say they are exploring every possible way to deliver aid to people in Gaza. Earlier today, the U.S. making its first airdrop of food to the region amid the crisis. Pallets of 38,000 meals ready to eat parachuting in. But with the U.N. saying Gaza is on the brink of famine, some aid groups argue it's not enough. This, as U.S. officials say, there has been significant progress toward a possible ceasefire. ABC's Tom Sufi Burridge in Israel tonight. Tonight, for the first time, the U.S. airdropping food aid into Gaza. Bundles including 38,000 ready-to-eat meals parachuted down from C-130 aircraft into that war-torn strip, according to U.S. officials, where half a million people, the U.N. says, are on the verge of famine and increasing numbers of children acutely malnourished. The extreme hunger on display today, with hundreds again surrounding an aid truck in northern Gaza. U.S. officials calling the need in the north absolutely critical. Adding the shortage of food means gangs are looting and reselling what valuable aid there is, suggesting the solution could be to flood the strip with assistance via all possible routes. Aid agencies arguing more U.S. pressure on Israel is key, questioning the effectiveness of airdrops. Partial measures will not get the job done. Airdrops are squarely in that category. You know, they, they, they come nowhere close to the level of need. Israel insisting it's working to increase the flow of aid into Gaza, adding supplies must not end up with Hamas. U.S. officials say they're pressing Israel to open more crossings into the Strip, but some Israeli protesters try and prevent the aid even getting that far. Well, this is one of the major crossing points for those aid trucks from Egypt over there into Israel here and onto Gaza. But as you can see, this route is completely blocked off by these protesters. They say they're doing it to stop the aid getting to the hands of Hamas. The American airdrops coming days after Israeli troops opened fire near a convoy of aid trucks. Israeli officials saying their soldiers were threatened and most of those killed were crushed in the chaos. But this UN mission visiting a nearby hospital saying a large number of the injured had gunshot wounds. We have seen people with gunshot wounds, we have seen amputees uh, and we have seen uh, children as young as 12. Tom Sufi Burridge back with us now from Tel Aviv tonight. And Tom, getting more aid into Gaza is also part of the ongoing negotiations for a ceasefire. So what more are we learning about a possible deal now? Yeah, with U.S. officials emphasizing the Israelis have more or less accepted a framework deal, adding the ball is in the court of Hamas. The unofficial deadline is in just over a week. Wait. A lot of hope for a potential agreement. Tom, thank you. Yemen's Houthi rebels claiming a victory in the Red Sea, sinking a commercial ship for the first time since the start of the Israel-Hamas war. The Belize flag cargo vessel had been drifting, leaking fuel and fertilizer since it was hit by a Houthi missile nearly two weeks ago. U.S. officials have warned of the potential for ecological damage to the Red Sea. Back here at home, the countdown is on for Super Tuesday. Today, former President Donald Trump picking up delegates in Michigan and Missouri. Trump and former South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley campaigning ahead of the crucial contest on Tuesday. And First Lady Jill Biden making stops in Arizona and Nevada. ABC's White House correspondent Mary Alice Parks on the campaign trail in Virginia tonight.
Tonight, Donald Trump and Nikki Haley zeroing in on Super Tuesday. With your help, we will win big on Super Tuesday. And we need someone who can actually win a general election. In just three days, 15 states and one territory will hold primaries, with more than one-third of the 2,400 delegates for the Republican nomination up for grabs. The most important issues for me would be tax and making homes more affordable. Polls show Trump vastly ahead of Haley by 60 points nationally and leading in every Super Tuesday state, according to 538. But the former president facing 91 criminal charges could be on trial in at least one case before the November election. Haley saying those legal woes are hurting the party. We need a new generational leader that can put in eight years, day and night, fixing the things we need fixed with no negativity, no drama, no vendettas. And two high-profile senators, Lisa Murkowski of Alaska and Maine's Susan Collins, signaling their support of Haley, giving her a boost. But without a major upset or two on Tuesday, Haley will have virtually no path to the nomination. And that's because many of the states voting Tuesday are winner take all, meaning even if she wins a sizable part of the vote, she may not earn any delegates, like in California with their whopping 169 delegates. On the Democratic side, First Lady Jill Biden campaigning in Arizona this weekend, talking about abortion, a state her husband flipped blue four years ago. Donald Trump is dangerous to women and to our families. We simply cannot let him win. Whit Tuesday could very easily be Nikki Haley's last stand. There are not enough delegates at stake this week for Trump to technically clinch the nomination, but he could get very close. And if he dominates across the country like the polls suggest he might, he could make it nearly impossible for her to catch him. Whit. A big week ahead, Mary Alice, thanks. Tonight, a suspect is under arrest in the brutal killing of a 23-year-old pregnant Amish woman in Pennsylvania. Sean Cranston from a nearby town held without bond, facing multiple charges, including homicide. The incident shocking the peaceful Amish community. Here's ABC's Phil Lipoff. Tonight, after an exhaustive five-day search in Pennsylvania and arrest in the disturbing killing of a pregnant Amish woman. Everyone seems to get along with them. Everybody's just stunned. Nobody could even imagine that this kind of stuff is going on. 52 year old Sean Cranston arrested and arraigned before dawn, charged with two counts of criminal homicide in the killings of 23 year old Rebecca Byler and her unborn baby. Police called to Byler's Spartansburg home Monday just after noon. Rebecca's husband Andy and a family friend finding her unresponsive in the living room with head and neck wounds, authorities say. Two young children also home were unharmed. On the day Byler was found dead, family members telling our ABC affiliate WJET they saw a red Jeep in her driveway. The same vehicle Cranston drives, according to the criminal complaint. The Amish community here is extremely rural and religious, shunning most modern technology, relying on horse and buggy. We're just a very tight-knit community and I'm just... I'm just absolutely heartbroken that this has happened, and I'm very, very concerned about the Amish community and worried for them. Police say Sean Cranston is from Cory, Pennsylvania, about 10 minutes away from the Byler home. He's being held without bail. There is a preliminary hearing scheduled for March 15th. Wait. Phil Lipoff for us tonight. Thank you. One of the paramedics convicted in the death of Elijah McLean will begin his five-year sentence for criminally negligent homicide. McLean was stopped by Denver area police in 2019 after reports of a suspicious person. The 23-year-old died after being put in a chokehold by officers and injected with a powerful sedative by paramedics. Here's ABC's Zoreen Shaw. Tonight, the paramedic involved in the death of Elijah McLean sentenced to five years in prison. Paramedic Peter Shakuniak, convicted of second degree unlawful administration of drugs and criminally negligent homicide. McLean's mother walked out of the sentencing with her fist in the air. It's their own actions that murdered my son. They had an opportunity to save him. He was speaking, he was talking when they got there. Prosecutors accuse Shakuniak, along with another paramedic, of administering an excessive amount of ketamine to sedate 23-year-old McLean nearly five years ago. Police confronted McLean as he walked back home after a 911 caller reported seeing someone sketchy in that area. McLean was not armed and was wearing a ski mask, which his family said was because his anemia would make him feel cold. Body camera footage shows McLean trying to explain he was going home. The officers grab him and place him in a chokehold. I'm 
so sorry. I have no good. I don't do that stuff. I don't do any fighting. Why were you attacking me? Paramedics later accused of administering an excessive amount of ketamine. McLean lost consciousness and was declared brain dead days later. He died in the hospital. As for the others charged in McLean's death, one officer was convicted of criminally negligent homicide, two others acquitted, and there is one more paramedic left to be sentenced. With Zorin Shah, thank you. There is still much more ahead on World News Tonight this Saturday. A freight train jumps the tracks, parts of it end up in a river. And the heart stopping rescue, new information on how this truck wound up dangling from a bridge. Next tonight, the National Transportation Safety Board is investigating a serious freight train derailment in Pennsylvania. Two engines from the Norfolk Southern train wound up partially in the Lehigh River near Bethlehem Township early this morning. Norfolk Southern says a small amount of diesel fuel leaked from the engines and will be cleaned up, but insists there is no threat to the public. We have an update on that harrowing bridge rescue in Louisville. You may remember uh, this truck dangling Friday from the Clark Memorial Bridge that connects Kentucky and Indiana. A firefighter was lowered to rescue the driver. That driver was unharmed, but authorities now say the driver of another vehicle that hit the truck and caused the accident suffered serious injuries. The bridge itself was not seriously damaged. When we come back tonight, LeBron James ready to make NBA history. To the index now, four years after the start of the COVID pandemic, the CDC is changing its guidance for those who test positive. They will no longer need to isolate for five days. They can return to work and regular activities just 24 hours after their fever goes away and their symptoms are improving. The new guidance is similar to the recommendations for other viral illnesses, such as the flu and RSV. LeBron James can make history tonight. The NBA's all-time scoring leader is just nine points away from becoming the first player to hit 40,000 points in his career. And the odds are pretty good that he'll get it done. James has only been held under nine points nine times in his 21 seasons. You can watch him chase history as his Lakers face the Denver Nuggets tonight right here on ABC. When we come back, a one-of-a-kind designer. We'll look back at the life of Iris Apfel. Finally tonight, we remember a designer who became an overnight sensation in her 80s. Fashion icon Iris Apfel was known for her bold, modern style. Go wild and get comfortable outside of your comfort zone. And candid beliefs. Being stylish and being fashionable are two entirely different things. You can easily buy your way into being fashionable. Style, I think, is in your DNA. Her signature ensembles, striking colors and patterns, adorned with oversized costume jewelry and her ever-present round glasses. You have to love what you're doing with your time on this planet, and that's what I've been doing. The New York native began her career as an interior designer and textile expert, managing restoration projects at the White House for nine presidents from Truman to Clinton. Calling herself a geriatric starlet, she was in her 80s when she reached celebrity status in the fashion world. Get old, but don't get boring. The subject of a documentary by Albert Mazel's called Iris. I didn't give a damn about going to the party or being at the party. It was getting dressed for the party. Popular on social media, too, with 3 million followers on Instagram. At 97, she signed as a fashion model with a global modeling agency. It's been a great ride and I've enjoyed it immensely. And on her 100th birthday, she had this message on aging and the key to a long and fabulous life. A sense of humor is absolutely necessary. I don't mean a ha-ha sense of humor, but I mean being able to look at all the silly little things and how foolish they are and how many important things we really don't pay enough attention to. Be an individual and not to follow the crowd. Iris Apfel was 102 years old. An icon who brought joy to so many. Have a great night. Thank you for making World News Tonight with David Muir, America's most watched newscast.